little self-conscious of this whole museum thing. Foster Tanback was at the University of Colorado, and that was one of those weekends that was typical for me. Uh, down, I, I was raised by atheists. My mother and father were atheists. And as a result of that, I was an atheist. And I often say to members of the church, are you a Christian just because mom and dad were? But see, that's why I was an atheist, but I was a very militant atheist. My father was a philosophy professor. He was sort of laid back. I was, go get him. <laughs> so I was president of the Indiana Atheist Association and was aggressively involved with Madeleine O'Hare and uh, was one of her main speakers for a period of time and came to believe in God because of my studies in science. I didn't think God could possibly do anything constructive with me. And I'm an atheist. I've never seen a Bible. I, I hadn't as, until I was almost 20. Never been in a church. But I thought, you know, there's a lot of atheists out there. I think I'll go talk to them because church people aren't going to want to listen to me. So I started talking to atheists in coffee houses and lectureships things that were associated with the church, but very indirectly. And we did a lot of plays. The Ted Mountjoy is here, uh, Rhinelander, Wisconsin, I don't know how many times. We went to places like that because our approach was to reach out to people who didn't believe. So we're working with atheists, agnostics, skeptics. And God kept blessing that. So for 47 years, that's what my emphasis has been. I don't talk in church buildings. I talk in townhouses and college lectureship facilities. I talk in motel meeting rooms, that sort of thing. And, and God has blessed us at Foster Standback. I, I still think this ought to be called the Foster Standback Museum. It's his stuff. I, you know, I'm very, I try to change that, try to get him to change it. But, you know, when somebody's brought you to Christ, you're sort of one-dimensional. That's sort of the way with me. I studied myself into faith, but it was my wife, Phyllis, who brought me in contact with the church and with somebody who believed the Bible, which I thought was pure garbage. And if you want to read my whole story, I, we have a handout table in the eating area. Uh, I'll be making reference to it off and on. And my story of why I left atheism is in a little blue book up there, Help Yourself. If you're interested, any of the stuff on that table is stuff I'll make reference to. While I'm on that subject, there's a table over there that has an atheist display. People I've worked with when I was an atheist, if you're interested, take a look. We also have sign-up sheets over there. If you'd like to be on our mailing list, the sign-up sheets are there on the edge of the table. Just put your name and address on there, and we'll be glad to add you to that. <coughs> but you know what's changed? What's changed is that I'm finding that it's not just atheists and agnostics that have got faith problems. What I'm finding is there's a lot of kids whose parents are leaders in the church who have faith problems. A lot of kids who have left the church. We have a website, doesgodexist.org. We have posted around. I get an average of maybe 200 emails a day. <coughs> a large percentage of those are from kids who are the sons and daughters of elders, preachers, deacons, leaders in the church. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. But the church has also been a major producer of atheists. Do you know that the leading atheists in this country, for the most part, <coughs> are former preachers in the Church of Christ? Did you know that? <laughs> Michael Shermer? Probably the best known atheist in this country right now. Published a skeptic magazine, which is over there. Pepperdine graduate. Went to Pepperdine and become a preacher. Todd Green, vice president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation in Milwaukee. Or, I'm sorry, in uh, uh, Madison. Former preacher of Church of Christ in the Detroit area. Lloyd Thorne runs the American Atheist Museum in San Francisco, former Church of Christ preacher. Why does all that happen? Well, I, I want to suggest something to you this morning. I want to challenge you a little bit this morning. I want to challenge you through the week. 
Because I think one of the things we haven't looked at is the wisdom of God. Do these lights yeah. go? Is that, can that be done? I want you to ask yourself a question. How do you view God? <coughs> what have you said to your kids about God? What have we said to kids through time about God? Have we projected God as a magician? I think our preacher schools push our preachers that way. God said it, boom, it happened. Is that your concept? Or do you view God as an engineer? See, what happened to me was when I'm talking to atheists and agnostics and skeptics, I'm not going to quote the Bible because they're atheists. They don't believe the Bible's anything. If there is no God, then the Bible's a bunch of stupid old myths. And so they'll ridicule the flood. They'll ridicule David and Goliath. They'll ridicule all those stories which you hold sacred and dear. <coughs> because if there is no God, the Bible has nothing to offer. Just interesting atheist <coughs> presence of literature. So that's been my approach in my coffee houses. I start with evidence. I talk about God as an engineer. My main line is you can intelligently and logically and reasonably and rationally believe in God. You don't have to put your brain in a tin can to be a Christian. You can logically and intelligently and rationally believe that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. But to a lot of Christians, that's blasphemy. God's a magician. He speaks and it happens. What's your view? Because you see, what's happened is our kids, our grandkids have learned to not trust magic. We live in a technological society. <coughs> our kids have been told in their philosophy classes at state universities that God is a God of gaps. That your parents and your grandparents and people in ancient times invented God to explain what they didn't understand. But now we understand, so we don't need this thing called God anymore. You say, well, that sounds silly. Listen, that's what your parents, what your kids, what your grandkids, that's what they're being told at state universities. And then professors will spend time ridiculing. You seen the movie, God is Not Dead? It's worth saying, folks. I don't like the last few minutes of it, but the rest of it, Man, that's what your kids are facing. And there's lots of reasons we're losing our kids and our grandkids. But a lot of it is rooted in what I'm talking about right now. So I think you need to look at the question of what do you understand when you read, let there be light, and there was light. God spoke. It happened. I'm a physics teacher. <coughs> Light is produced by the acceleration of electric charge. That's physics 101. So when God created light, did he do it by accelerating charge? I would project that to an atheist agnostic. Is God a magician or is he an engineer? What's your understanding? What do you convey to your kids? Have you put God in the same box with Kreskin and Henning and all those other great magicians? When you read things like, for he commanded and they were created, sapped. Or did he command angels? Did he command those people, that those angelic beings that Ephesians 6 and Ephesians 3 talk about to be responsible for the creation. How do you perceive God? See, God doesn't call man to blind acceptance. Think about that statement for a minute. God doesn't call man to blind acceptance. How can I believe in God? I was raised by parents who never went to church. 
I was raised by parents who ridiculed God. I remember going to a National Geographic presentation. Remember those in the old days? The Audubon Society. They had these 16 millimeter films and some guy would narrate. I remember my mom took me to one where they had this thing called an anglerfish. A really ugly fish. <clears throat> Sat on the floor of the ocean and he had a little appendage with a little piece of flesh hanging off of it. It looked a little bit like a worm. And he wiggled it. And when a little fish would come up to check it out, he grabbed it and ate it. And I remember to this day my mother saying, now John, that's the way life is. That's the way life is. You win by deception. You win by being fit. My father said it's survival of the fittest. So be fit. So I was fit. <laughs> I was tough. I could handle it. Survival of the fittest. How was I going to come to know Jesus? See, nobody could quote scripture to me. I was an atheist. I never read the Bible. I could quote a whole section that thought were really stupid. I could tell all those stories and make fun of them. But I had no faith. When I started taking signs, and I started looking at the creation, and I started seeing the wisdom and the power, and I kept being told by these professors who I was supposed to agree with that this happened by chance, began to say, wait, 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 wait a minute. The psalmist says the heavens declare the glory of God. And notice this. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. It's not saying He zapped it into existence. I want to show you later on this week some of the problems that you create for kids when you make God a magician. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. That's active. That's the engineer. And as a college student looking in that big telescope at the Lick Observatory, I could see the work of his hands. And I could see myself saying, this is by chance. What? What? The Bible says we can know there is a God. How? Through the things he has made. You know what the most popular publication we have is among church people? It's called Dandy Designs. We have a little column in the paper called Dandy Designs. When I started doing this back in 1972, I thought, oh, for an issue or two, I'll do Dandy Designs. It'll show people some wisdom, some intelligence. <laughs> now we have five volumes of 200 examples each. We have a website called Dandy Designs. I spent time all over the place, talking to people about how you can know there is a God through the things He has made because that's what gave me my faith. That's why I say to kids that are skeptical, look at the evidence. Think! 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 One of my favorite stories, I did a lectureship one time in a little town in Texas. A little fifth grader came up to me at the end of the thing on Sunday. I was getting ready to leave. He said, he pulled on my shirt and he said, you know how many times you hollered think this weekend? <laughs> I looked at her and I said, well, no. And she pulled out her clipboard. <laughs> 153 times you hollered think! <laughs> and my question to her was, are you doing it? Are you doing it? Isaiah says, he who fashioned and made the earth not he who zapped the earth. Not a magic trick. He found it. He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. That's thought. That's purpose. I love Proverbs 8. Proverbs 8 is so 21st century because it deals with God's methods. Does not wisdom call out? Does not understanding raise her voice? What is science? 
I tell them I taught in the public schools for 41 years. I told my kids, you know what you're going to do in here? You're going to learn about how God did what he did. It's about the only time I mentioned God in, all, in my classroom until a kid raised the question. Because remember, I'm in a public school. Okay? But I did that to disarm kids who thought somehow there was going to be a problem. Science is knowledge. And Proverbs 8 starts out with wisdom writing the entire thing. Verse 4 through 5. Oh, you, old men, I call out. That's wisdom talking. I raise my voice to all mankind. You who are simple. I'm simple. Gain prudence. You who are foolish. Oh, man. I have been so foolish. I lived so many years as an atheist, militant, aggressive, destructive, obnoxious, immoral. My wife will tell you I still have horrible self-image problems. I've been so foolish. <coughs> I've done so many things that I'm so ashamed of. Foolish. Gain understanding. Wisdom says the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work. Before his deeds of old. Do you understand what that's saying? That is an eloquent statement of quantum mechanics. You know what quantum mechanics is? Quantum mechanics is the discovery that the methods God has used to form the building blocks of the creation are so complex it takes a whole new science to understand it. Wisdom! Wisdom! Everybody thinks it's some kind of a big problem. It's not a problem. It's coming to understand more about God. So wisdom calls out. And he possessed wisdom at the start of his work. You know, all the way through the Bible, you see statement after statement after statement that talks about the fact that God created time. And before time began, God established the building blocks of the creation. You think about the implications of that. What is quantum mechanics? It's the study of that. What happened before time? God created time. Try to get your mind around that one. And yet now, in quantum mechanics, we are proving that it's true. So look at the passages. John 17, 24. You loved me before the creation of the world. You see, God knew as he started creating time and the elements that would be necessary to produce you and your body that there had to be time. Matter needs time to exist. God doesn't. Ephesians 1, 4. He chose us in him. He had the idea of the church before the creation of the world. 1 Peter 1, 20. He was chosen before the creation of the world. 2 Timothy 1, 9. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. That's so profound. It shows the incredible nature of God. Promised before the beginning of time. Wisdom says, I was appointed from eternity from the beginning before the world began. <clears throat> Folks, our young people need to hear this. They need to know about God, the Creator, the Engineer, the infinite wisdom necessary to produce the creation. And so Proverbs 8 goes on and it talks about the things we deal with in science. When there were no oceans, I was giving birth. When there were no springs abounding in water. <laughs> Did you follow what just happened with that comet they landed on? <laughs> Hilarious. They've been trying to explain where the water on the earth came from. Okay? Trying to explain where we get our water. So the big proposal was, well, it came from comets. So we'll land on the comet we'll prove that. They did land on the comet. <laughs> and they took a sample of water. And the water they took a sample of couldn't have possibly been the same water that was on the earth that had an extra neutron in it. 
Looks like God just put it in there and said, ha, ha, wait, watch this, you guys. Watch this one. Boy, am I going to shoot you down? Amazing. God's wisdom. Given birth before there were no springs. He goes on and he says, before the mountains were settled in place, before the hills, I was given birth. That's wisdom he's talking about. Do you understand what would happen if there were no mountains? If there were no mountains in a few thousand years, the whole earth would be perfectly flat and completely covered with water about half a mile deep. I mean, it wouldn't be just wading through a flooded field in Iowa. We saw that on the way over. <coughs> it would be a completely uninhabitable earth. He goes on and he talks about the dust of the earth, the soil. <coughs> Before he made the earth or his fields or any dust of the world. How do you have this? How do you have trees and plants? How do you have a garden? Have you ever thought about what it takes to make soil? The engineering involved to make something that will produce all that wonderful stuff we had for breakfast today and that incredible stuff we had last night. Folks, that doesn't happen by chance. That's wisdom. He goes on and he says, I was there when he set the heavens in place. The heavens are in place. We're taking more and more pictures of deep areas of space. When he marked out the horizon on the face of the deep, when he established clouds and fixed securely the fountains of the deep. You know where that water came from? That we swam through as we left church last night? <laughs> came from the ocean. From the fountains of the deep. What an incredible piece of engineering. He gave the sea its boundaries so the waters would not overstep his command. And he marked out the foundations of the land. We've just learned how continents are produced, how they move, how they arrange themselves to produce the resources that we need. I was the craftsman at his side. That's wisdom again. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence, rejoicing in his whole world and delighting in mankind. <coughs> One of the books that we have that you can borrow downstairs, and any of those materials can be borrowed to sign the sheet, help yourself, return it to the college when you're done, is a discussion of frequently asked questions, questions I hear from kids, questions I hear on the web, questions I hear in lectureships. It's a pretty good slick book because there are so many questions that show answers in the wisdom of God. I'd like to point out to you that when you read the Bible, and when you talk to your kids about the Bible, that you not present them God the magician. You present them God, the wisdom, bearer, the one who makes sense in all he does. We have a new book that's going to come out in a month or so. It's called The Rational God. And what the book does is to go back and look at every single area of Jesus, every single area of the Bible, I say, does this make sense? One of my favorite studies is the miracles of Jesus. Do you ever wonder why Jesus just didn't go around and cure everybody? Why did he just take the whole earth and make it so there's no more sickness, no more death, no more problems? God had a better purpose. Every single miracle has a reason. It took me the longest time to figure out the thing with the pigs and catarines. <laughs> You know, that one really threw me for a while. Yeah. And then I have a friend who's a psychologist, and he said, well, he said, do you understand that the man in the tombs was mentally ill? Did you ever think about that? Go back and read that. And what you see is that Jesus had power not only over the physical, not only over the leprosy, not only over the oceans, not only over whether you could walk on water or not, he had power over the things that get messed up in our heads. Every miracle has a purpose. And so the Bible says God formed man of the dust of the earth. Now let me point something out to you. A little Hebrew here. There's three words in Hebrew that can be used to describe the things God does. One is the Hebrew word bara. We'll make reference to this a couple of times through the week. 
B-A-R-A in the Hebrew language is a word that is used in reference to only what God can do. Because I understand when I say God's not a magician, I'm not saying he doesn't do things we can't understand. I'm not saying he doesn't do miraculous things. But it's only used 31 times in the whole Bible. But that's one method. The second word that is used throughout Genesis and throughout most of the Old Testament is the Hebrew word asah, A-S-A-H. That word is used when God uses a natural process. So he made, and man does that. You know, we make things. We don't create things. Steve has done a marvelous job of making this school, making the facility here. So much better when I was here back in the 70s. Oh, my. I stayed here one night in the 70s in November giving lectureships in town. There was no heat in the room. There was a hole in the window. I had one little girl from Texas. I said, why are you coming here? And she looked at me and she says, only one reason. She says, it's York. <laughs> because she could have been in Texas in a nice, warm, heated room. What a change. What an incredible process. But the important thing to understand is that's made. He didn't create this school. He made it with tons and tons of other people. He's just one facilitator. You say, well, that's not what you have up there. No, because the word that is used here is the Hebrew word yachur. God formed man. He didn't make him. He didn't create him. He formed man of the dust of the earth. And that Hebrew word yachur is normally used in reference to something an artist does. <coughs> A pottery word. You see, the word bara is used in reference to man. In verse 26, God said, let us create man, bara, in our image. Is he talking about this body? We are spiritually created in God, God's image. Our soul is a miracle. You don't explain the soul in any physical terms. <clears throat> I had a laugh last year that some of the atheists decided, okay, we're going to find the part of the human brain that produces worship. <laughs> I thought when I saw that article, I thought, <laughs> that's funny. Okay. So where is it in a monkey? If you're going to say a monkey evolved into man, you got a section of the human brain that is also present in a monkey? Give me a monkey that worships. Where is this section? What happened was, other scientists looked at that and said, you guys are out of your mind. Because if the capacity to worship is part of the human brain, then you have no explanation of worship. You just eliminated everything we teach in the work of Charles Darwin. You may want to chew on that one for a minute. But isn't it interesting how God thwarts the wisdom of man? God formed man of the dust of the earth. <coughs> when the Bible talks about the garden, look at Genesis 2, verse 8. The Lord God had planted a garden. My wife, Cindy, I didn't know this when I married her. Turns out she has a green thumb. I have a brown thumb. <laughs> what I've discovered is she can plant a garden and make it grow. But that takes work. Sometimes she'll be out there, it's dark. She's out there pulling weeds, fussing about the mosquitoes. But you see, she planted, and God planted a garden. He didn't sap it. God made all kinds of trees. <coughs> so it's important to understand that in the biblical account, consistently, God is portrayed as the engineer, not as the magician. By the way, an interesting picture of this. We just learned about the expanding universe not too long ago. 1936. That's not too long ago. The older I get, the less far back it is. But we have just learned something about the cosmos that's interesting. We learned that the universe was expanding back then. In the last six, seven years, we've learned that the universe is accelerating in its expansion. And what's interesting is that if you go back to the Genesis account, and I have all these passages where this is stated, 
We are told that God stretched out the heavens like a curtain. And if you look at that word that is called stretched out here, the Hebrew word is natah, it's like what you do when you pull the cord on the lawnmower. You start out slow and you go fast, right? You stretch it out. And what this Hebrew word would involve would be the process of the creation being stretched out is exactly what we have just learned. The Hubble telescope has made over a hundred major discoveries in astronomy and cosmology and every single one of them supports the biblical account. So what I try to say to young people is look, look, come to the evidence. Don't look at what has happened in the church at home. Don't look at the hypocrisy you saw in somebody who claims to be a Christian. Even the atheist. Isn't it any really good to, to fuss and fume about what organized religion has done that is wrong? Be it the followers of Muhammad or the followers of Jesus Christ. Because people have made horrible mistakes in the name of Christ. The issue for you young people in the 21st century is what is the evidence? Do we see God as an engineer or as a magician? These are the things which the Lord God created and made. Genesis 2 and verse 3. According to God, he used both methods. There are things he did miraculously, and there are things that he has done naturally. May I suggest to you one more thing here? The plan of salvation makes sense too. I've heard people say, well, you just get baptized because God said do it. Just do what God says. Okay. I, I, I don't question that we should do what God says, okay? But may I suggest to you the one reason we have apathy and indifference in the church is because we have said baptism is something you do because God said it, not because there's been a change in your heart. Not because you have understood dying to sin as Romans 6 presents it. And so we're told in Acts 10 and verse 43, who may believe shall receive the remission of sins. Does it make sense that you have to believe? Well, that's kind of given, right? I mean, nobody questions that. The trouble is people try to hang this passage out separate from everything else. In Romans 6, beginning with verse 3, we're told to die to sin. You know, I don't think we've done a good job of that passage in the church. Right. I don't think we've gotten people to understand that there's a change that takes place in you. And baptism is dying to sin, burying the old man. That makes sense. There's lots of things I do because I know God wants me to do them. Mostly things I don't do because I know God doesn't want me to do them. But that in and of itself does not motivate me to do very much. But if I die to sin, then I'm changed. I'm a new creature. You know, and, and, and don't please don't misunderstand this next statement. <laughs> in some ways, I feel sorry for people who have grown up in the church. In some ways. You say, what? In some ways, I feel sorry for people that have grown up in the church. Because they haven't seen what the new life is about. In the sense that those of us who grew up in the sewer have seen it. My daughter Wendy was 17 years old. She hadn't become a Christian. And she had worked with me lots of places. As a matter of fact, we were coming home from a workshop like this one. Except it was a very intense thing. 56 hours of classwork. She had been with me through the whole thing. But she still <clears throat> had not been baptized into Christ. And I wondered, where have I failed? So I finally said to Wendy as we were driving, I said, Wendy, I don't understand something. I said, you, you've been with me and all this stuff. You've seen this ministry. You've been a part of it. But you're still not a Christian. You haven't been baptized. What's holding you up? And she said, well, Dad, I'm a pretty good kid. I don't have much to repent of. Talk 
by getting hit with a two by four. There was a hole in my teaching, wasn't there? There was a hole in her understanding. See, see, I grew up in a sewer. When I became a Christian, I could hardly get my mind around the concept that I could bury that old John Clayton and that I could put everything I had done in the ground. That I could begin anew. And that I could be something different. And that my life could be changed. And my values could be changed. And everything about me would be different. And that God somehow would forget everything that happened in the past. And so when I came out of that water, it was just unreal. I was weeping. To see, and I loved that discussion last night about tears. I was weeping to realize how different I was going to be. You know, we have a, a rather extensive prison ministry. That's one part of our work. We have about 15,000 prisoners right now that we're studying with. And uh, <laughs> we baptize a lot of guys. One of the things that's interesting about baptizing a man in prison is that when you bring him up out of the baptistry and you're standing there holding him, they don't want to leave. <laughs> they don't want to leave. I sat there with one guy in a prison in Michigan. I had my arm around him. I brought him up out of the water. I've got my hand. He's got a hold of my wrist. We're sitting there. We sat 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 there. And the corner of my eye looked, I could see the wardens doing this, you know. I finally said, James, we gotta we gotta get out of here. He said, just give me another 30 seconds. <laughs> just give me another 30 seconds, because once I step out of this bacteria, I'm having to fight the world again. Right. Mm. Exactly. Now, a lot of you can understand that, maybe some of you can't. Yeah. But what I'm saying to you is that the concept of repentance makes wonderful sense, especially to a lost and dying world. How are we going to convert the world if we're afraid to tell people what the source of our strength is? How many times have you confessed Christ? Once? Does that check that one off? Alright. Preacher said, you believe Jesus Christ, Son of God, I do. Done it for life. No, you're not done for life. How are you going to change the world? If you don't continue to confess Christ. And then to bury the old man. And that your life will be different. My life is different. Not because of any strength that I have. But because God makes sense. I think it's important to understand as we look at this. That the past. My past has been very different. These are three of my buddies. Bill Murray. John Garth. Madeline O'Hare. My atheist buddies. I can tell you the same story about my family. What does atheism do for you? Folks, this is another message to take to your kids, to your grandkids. Where do you go in life? Madeline and John Garth were murdered by her personal business secretary, a man I knew. He had embezzled $600,000 from her. She was going to rat on him, he killed her. Buried her and her son and her granddaughter in a couple of barrels in Texas. Madeline was a miserable, miserable woman. She was so unhappy. And part of that was because she was not treated with compassion by people who claimed to be Christians. Her son Bill, <laughs> Madeline told me when he left Madeline, she said, well, he found out he could make more money with Jerry Falwell than he could with me. <laughs> that was her rationale. And Bill and I have done programs together. A lot of things we don't share views on. But this family has a long history of struggles and difficulties in life. 
And my life is the same way. Let me tell you about my, for some reason this isn't advancing, somebody's, there we go. There's Robin and John Garth. Those are the three that were killed. That was shortly before they were killed. We have a debate with John Garth that's down on the table if you're interested in reading it. It's not worth reading in my opinion, but it's, it's an interesting demonstration of the way he thinks. But let me tell you about my family. And, and I tell you this story because I think it probably will have some meaning for some of you. My father and I, I, I was disowned when I became a Christian. When he developed leukemia, my brothers left. My father was no longer fit, you see. And my father then reached out to me and we reestablished and he became a believer. Because of all of his philosophy and all of his connections didn't reach him when he was no longer fit. But the one I really want to share with you is my mother. My mother was a strong woman. When my father died, she became the ruling matriarch at the Indiana University Retirement Center. What that meant is when they wanted to put, plant a tree, they asked her where to put it. <laughs> okay? She ran the place, even though she was just, as I called her, an inmate. <laughs> she didn't like that. When she was 90 years old, she had a stroke. After a bunch of TIAs, they quit listening to her. They put her in the medical assistance ward, and they wouldn't even let her attend the business meetings. She couldn't handle that. My brother said, what are you going to do? I said, well, even what am I going to do? Well, we don't want to do anything with her. You know, that type of thing. So I took her home. She lived in a place close by us. When she became 93, she became discontinent. One night I was cleaning her up so she could go back to her room. And uh, as I was cleaning her up, she said, you know, John, she said, your brothers wouldn't do this. They wouldn't clean me up. I said, Mom, my brothers aren't Christians. And that's not what they do. I said, I'm a Christian. I, I do this. I do this because you're my mother, I do this because I love you, and I do this because I love Jesus Christ. It's part of my makeup. I'm different because Jesus has changed me. Silent. See, she didn't like that kind of discussion, but when you're cleaning in her rear end, she's leaning over the table, there's not a lot she can do. <laughs> <laughs> About five minutes later, she said, well, John, you know, the people of Meadowood wouldn't do this either. I said, Mom, Meadowood is a university retirement center. They don't deal with situations where people become impaired. They put them in the medical ward. I didn't want to see you there. I said, Christians do this, Mom, but, but they don't. Another couple of minutes of silence. And then she said, John, I don't want to be an atheist anymore. <laughs> and you know, I had used every logical argument I had. I had dumped every scientific evidence in the book. I had forced her to watch my DVDs. I had questioned her about pages in my book. But when I was cleaning her rear end, it made a difference. And there's a message in there somewhere, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> See, I, I think we need to understand that those are the messages kids understand. Your kid, your grandkid, if they've left the church, if they've gone tailing off, they didn't get there overnight, they won't get out of it overnight. But, if we change our approach to them and say, look, God is a God of wisdom, God is a God of purpose. You can intelligently believe in God and steer them away from church splits and steer them away from human hypocrisy and steer them away from issues. They'll come back. Robert said, train up a child in the way that you go and when they are old, they will not depart therefrom. Yeah. And 
that is facilitated when we give them answers, reasonable answers. Let me suggest to you, if you want to hear more of my story, there's a little booklet down in the cafeteria. It's on our handout table, which is inside the doors where we eat. Help yourself. We also have, no, went by. We also have some booklets that we use in our lectureships. If you'd like some, help yourself. This is scientific evidence for the existence of God. If you want sources, there's a stack of bibliographies. Uh, we are having, what we're doing with the college is I donated the DVDs to the college. However, I'll tell you, you can watch them online free. But if you'd like a set of them, the college, I've given the college the DVDs, okay? So whatever you pay them for the DVD will go entirely to the college. Follow me? So let's get that 10000 so they can get what they need there. And that's just a little bit of a help. Because I can produce those spanks fairly cheaply. It's mailing that kills us. So let me encourage you. And I do have teacher's guides with me. If you're thinking you might use them in class, see me. Or see Cindy. And we'll get them for you. They look like this. We also have some audios down there if you're interested. Let me try to show you a few of the other things that are available. Our book, The Source, there's two versions. This is the older version. I'm not sure, unless you're an engineer or something, you'll want that one. There is a high school version down there, which is much more up to date, and which is what I would probably recommend. If you'd like a copy, you can borrow it, or you can purchase it at our cost. I mentioned Andy Designs. They're down there. There's five volumes now of those. We have books dealing with other subjects, <coughs> the fossil record. And I'm going to talk about the problem of human suffering a little later this week. I, I guess God has given me stuff that I had no idea why it was happening, but that I've seen the purpose of. Atheists will say, well, how can you believe in God when you have babies born with birth defects? How can you believe in God when you've got people that are blind? How can you believe in God? I have a son who was born blind, mentally retarded, with cerebral palsy, Muscular dystrophy and schizophrenia, all wrapped up in one little package. Mm -hmm. So I've been given an answer. And I've never had an atheist want to argue with me about that issue. Because I've been there. And I want to talk more about that later this week. I have a lady who's worked with us that's had cancer three times, lost her husband to cancer. Judy has converted over a hundred people to Christ through cancer. Just because she has a testimony. As an elder's wife, she had to deal with it. And we have other books. I do want to mention to you that we have a bi-monthly journal. And there are old copies down there. I brought a ton of them. If you'd like to take a handful back to pass out at your congregation, please feel free to help yourself. Uh, we're going to trash them if you don't take them. So please help yourself to those. And if you want to be on our mailing list, there's a sign-up sheet over there that you can use for that. But we have different topics each week or each month. It comes out every other month, actually. And uh, there's all kinds of stuff in that 32 page bullet. We have correspondence courses, they are downstairs, and I have our email addresses all over the area. And we do have the archaeology series that we're giving to the school as well, as, and in addition to books by other people. We also have grandkid material. We have 16 children's books, and they're down there on the tables. Please feel free to look those over if you have an interest in those things, dealing with all kinds of subjects and issues that kids are connected with. And don't forget our websites. There's also a catalog there. I'm going too fast for the computer here, apparently. It's not moving for me. But there's a catalog, and, there, and I do have teacher's guides for other materials if you have an interest, and there are catalogs down there. Well, tomorrow we'll look a little bit at atheist challenges. <coughs> but if you have questions at any time, don't hesitate to, to see me about them. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing about the Roman history. And, I saw somebody pull a sword out here, so <laughs> he's got a force issue. Are there another announcements we need to make before we take a break? We start at 10:10 on the nose. 10:10. Thanks for coming. Thank you.